Fortunately, I have a, a guest today, uh, Dr. Adam Wright, uh, who will be uh, doing an interview style session and will answer questions for you. Uh, this is Adam's sort of bread and butter is exactly how to translate this kind of technology into, into the clinic. Uh, he's currently in the partner system at uh, the Brigham, I guess. Uh, but he's about to uh, uh, become a trader and leave us in Boston and, and uh, uh, occupy a position at Vanderbilt University, uh, so t for which we wish him luck, but I'm glad that we caught him uh, before he leaves this summer. Okay, so quite frankly, I wish that I could tell you a much happier story than the one that you're going to hear from me <laughs> during the prepared part of my talk. Uh, and maybe Adam will, will uh, cheer us up and make us more optimistic based on, on, uh, on his experience. So you may have noticed that uh, AI is hot. Uh, so uh, HIMSS, for example, is the Health Information Management System Society. It's a big, uh, uh, they hold annual meetings and, and uh, consist of a lot of vendors and a lot of academics. and. Uh, it's one of these huge trade show kinds of things with balloons hanging over booths and big, uh, big open spaces. Um, and so, for example, they're now talking about AI-powered healthcare. Uh, on the other hand, it's important to remember this graph. So this is the sort of technology adoption graph, uh, and it's called the hype cycle. And what you see here is that uh, R&D, that's us, produces some wonderful, interesting idea. And then all of a sudden, people get excited about it. So who are the people that get most excited about it? It's the people who think they're going to make a fortune from it. And these are, are the so-called vulture capitalists, uh, venture capitalists. <laughs> uh, and so the venture capitalists come in and they encourage people like us to go out and found companies, or if, if not us, then our, our students, uh, to go found companies and figure out how to turn this nascent idea into some important uh, money-making enterprise. Now, the secret of venture capital is that they know that about 90% of the companies that they fund are going to tank. They're going to do very badly. And so um, as a result, what they hope for and what they expect and what the good ones actually get is that uh, that one in 10 that becomes successful makes so much money that it makes up for all of the investment that they poured into the 9 out of 10 that do badly. So I actually remember uh, in the 1990s, um, I was uh, uh, helping a group pitch a company to um, Kleiner Perkins, which is the big venture, one of the big venture capital funds in Silicon Valley. And we walked into their boardroom, and they had a copy of the San Jose Mercury News, which is the local uh, newspaper for uh, Silicon Valley, on their table. And they were just beaming because there was an article that said that uh, in the past year, uh, the two best and the two worst investments in Silicon Valley had been by their company, right? But that's pretty good, right? If, you're, if you get two winners and two really bad losers, you're making tons and tons of money. So they were in a good mood and they funded us. We didn't make them any money. Uh, uh, so what you see on this curve is that there's a kind of, uh, of set of rising expectations that comes from uh, the development of these technologies. And you have some early adopters. And then you have the newspapers writing about how this is the revolution and everything will be different from here on out. Uh, and then you have uh, some additional activity beyond early adopters. And then people start looking at this and going, well, it really isn't as good as, uh, uh, as it's cracked up to be. And then you have the steep decline uh, where uh, there's some consolidation and some failures. Uh, 
and people have to go back to venture capital to try to get more money uh, in order to keep their companies going. Uh, and then there's a kind of trough where people go, oh, well, this was another of these failed uh, kind of technological innovations. Um, and then uh, gradually you start uh, reaching what this author calls the slope of enlightenment, uh, where people realize that, okay, it's not really as bad as we thought it was when it didn't meet our lofty expectations. And then gradually, if it's successful, then you get multiple generations of the product and it does achieve adoption. The adoption almost never reaches the uh, peak that it was expected to reach at the time of the, the top of the hype cycle. Uh, but it becomes useful, it becomes profitable, it becomes productive. Now, I've been around long enough to see a number of these cycles go by. So in the 1980s, for example, uh, at a time that was now jokingly referred to as AI summer, where people were building expert systems, um, and these expert systems were going to just revolutionize everything. Um, I remember going to a conference where um, the Campbell Soup Company uh, had built an expert system that, that uh, was based on the expertise of some old timers who were retiring. And what this expert system did is it told you how to clean the vats of soup, you know, these giant million gallon things where they make soup, uh, when you're switching from making one kind of soup to another. So, you know, if you're making uh, beef consomme and you switch to making beef barley soup, you don't need to clean the vat at all. Whereas if you're switching from, uh, you know, uh, uh, something like clam chowder to a consomme, then you need to clean it really well. And so this was exactly the kind of thing that they were doing. And there were literally, literally thousands of these applications being built. And at the top of the hype cycle, uh, all kinds of companies like Campbell Soup and the airlines and everybody was investing huge amounts of money into this. And then there was a kind of failure of expectations. These didn't turn out to be as good as people thought they were going to be uh, or as valuable as people thought they were going to be. And then all of a sudden uh, came AI winter. So AI winter followed AI summer. There was no AI fall. Uh, <laughs> except in a different sense of the word fall. Um, and, uh, uh, and all of a sudden, funding dried up, and, and the whole thing was declared a failure. But in fact, today, if you go out there and you look at, you know, Microsoft Excel has an expert system-based help system uh, bundled inside it. And there are tons of such applications. It's just that now they're no longer considered cutting-edge applications of artificial intelligence, they're simply considered you know, routine practice. So they, they've become incorporated without the hype into all kinds of existing products, and, and they're serving a very useful role, but they didn't make those venture capital firms the tons of money that they had hoped to make. There was a similar boom and bust cycle in the 2000s around the uh, creation of the World Wide Web and e-commerce. Okay? So e-commerce, again, there was this un unbelievably inflated set of expectations. Um, and then around the year 2000, there was a big crash where all of a sudden, um, you know, people realized that the value in these applications was not as high as what they expected it to be. Nevertheless, you know, Amazon is doing just fine. Uh, and there are plenty of online e-commerce sites that are in perfectly good operating order today, and, uh, but it's no longer the same hype about this technology. It's just become an accepted part of the way that you do business in almost everything. Yeah? Uh, when you speak of expert systems, that mean rule-based systems? They were either rule-based or pattern matching systems. There were two basic kinds. Uh, I think a week from today, I'm going to talk about some of, of that and how it relates to modern machine learning. So uh, we'll see some examples. OK. Well, a cautionary tale uh, is, uh, is IBM's uh, uh, Watson Health. So uh, 
uh, I assume most of you remember when Watson hit the big time by beating the Jeopardy champions. Uh, this was back in the early 2010s or something. I don't remember exactly which year. Um, and they had, in fact, built a really impressive set of technologies that went out and read all kinds of online sources and distilled them into a kind of representation that they could very quickly look up things when they were challenged with the Jeopardy question. Um, and then it had a sophisticated set of uh, algorithms that would try to find the best answer for some question. And they even had all kinds of bizarre special purpose things. I remember there was a probabilistic model that figured out where the uh, daily double squares were most likely to be on the Jeopardy board. And then they did a utility theoretic calculation to figure out if they did hit the daily double, what was the optimum amount of money to bet based on, on the machine's performance in order to optimize. They decided that humans typically don't bet enough when they have a chance uh, in, on the daily double. So there was a lot of very special purpose stuff done for this. So this was a huge uh, publicity bonanza. And IBM decided that next they were going to tackle medicine. And so they were going to take this technology and apply it to medicine. They were going to read all of the medical journals and all of the uh, medical uh, uh, electronic medical records that they could get their hands on and somehow this technology would again distill the right information so that they could answer questions like a Jeopardy question, except not stated in its funny backward way, uh, where you might say, okay, for this patient, what is the optimum therapy? And it would go out and use the same technology to figure that out. Now, that was a perfectly reasonable thing to try the, the problem they ran into was this hype cycle that the people who made this publicly known were their marketing people and not their technical people. And the marketing people overpromised like crazy. Okay? They said, surely this is just going to solve all these problems and we won't need any more research in this area because, man, we got it. I, I mean, I'm overstating it even from the marketing point of view. Uh, and so uh, Watson for Oncology used this cloud-based supercomputer to digest massive amounts of data, um, and, uh, um, and that data included all kinds of different, different things. So I'm going to go into a little bit of detail about what some of their problems were. This is from an article in, uh, in this, this journal, Stat News, uh, which did an investigative piece on, on what happened with Watson. Uh, and so, you know, they say what I just said, breathlessly promoting its signature brand. IBM sought to capture the world's imagination and quickly zeroed in on a high-profile target, which was cancer. So this was going to solve the problem of uh, some patient shows up, is diagnosed with cancer, and you want to know how to treat this person. So this would use all of the literature and all of everything that it had gathered from previous treatments of previous patients and it would give you the optimal uh, solution. Now, it has not been a success. There are a few dozen hospitals that have adopted the system, very few of them in the United States, more of them abroad. Um, and um, uh, the foreigners complain that its advice is biased toward American patients and American approaches. Uh, to me, the biggest problem is that they haven't actually published anything that validates in a scientific sense that this is a good idea, that it's getting the right answers. Uh, and my guess is the reason for this is because it's not getting the right answers a lot of the time. Uh, but that doesn't prevent marketing from, uh, from selling it. Um, the other problem is that they made a deal with Memorial Sloan Kettering, which is one of the leading cancer hospitals in the country to say, we're going to work with you guys and, and your oncologists in order to figure out what really is the right answer. And so I think they tried to do what their marketing says that they're doing, which is to really derive the right answer from reading all of the literature and looking at past cases. 
but I don't think that worked well enough. And so what they wound up doing is turning to real oncologists saying, what would you do under these circumstances? And so what they wound up building is something like a rule-based system that says, if you see the following symptoms and you have the following genetic defects, then this is the right treatment. Okay. And so the promise that this was going to be a machine learning system that revolutionized cancer care by finding the optimal treatment really is not what they, what they provided. Uh, and as the article says, the system doesn't really create new knowledge. And so it, it's AI only in the sense of um, providing a search engine that um, when it makes a recommendation can point you to articles that are uh, a reasonable reflection of what it's recommending. Um, well, I, I'm going to stop going through this litany, but you'll see it in, uh, uh, in the slides which we'll post. Um, they had a big contract with MD Anderson, which is another leading cancer center in the United States. MD Anderson uh, spent about $60 million uh, on this contract implementing it, and they pulled the plug on it because they decided that it just wasn't, wasn't doing the job. Um, now, by contrast, uh, there was a much more successful uh, attempt years ago, uh, which uh, was less driven by marketing and more driven by medical need. And the idea here was CPOE stands for Computerized Physician Order Entry. The idea behind CPOE was that um, if you want to affect the behavior of clinicians in ordering tests or drugs or procedures, what you want to do is to make sure that they are interacting with the computer so that when they order, for example, some insanely expensive drug, um, the system can come back and say, hey, do you realize that there's a drug that costs one one hundredth as much, which according to the clinical trials that we have on record is just as effective as the one that you've ordered. And so, for example, here at the Beth Israel many years ago, uh, they implemented a system like that, and in the first year, they showed that they saved something like $16 million in the pharmacy just by ordering cheaper variants of drugs that uh, could have been very expensive. And they also found that the doctors who were do doing the ordering were perfectly satisfied with that because they just didn't know how expensive these drugs were. I mean, that's not one of the things that they pay attention to. Um, so th there are many uh, applications like that that are, are uh, uh, driven by this. And again, here are some statistics. You can reduce error rates by half. You can reduce uh, severe uh, medication errors by 88 uh, percent. Uh, 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 you can have a 70 percent reduction in antibiotic-related adverse drug events. Uh, you can reduce length of stay, which is a, another big goal that people go after. Um, and um, uh, at least if you're an optimist, you can believe these extrapolations that say, well, we could prevent 3 million adverse drug events uh, at uh, uh, big city hospitals in the United States if everybody used systems like this. Um, so the benefits are that it prompts uh, uh, with warnings against possible drug interactions, allergies, or overdoses. Uh, uh, it, it can be kept up to date by some sort of mechanism where people read the literature and, and keep updating the databases that this is driven from. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it can do sort of mechanical things like eliminate confusion about drug names that sound similar and stuff like that. Uh, and so the LeapFrog group, which does a lot of meta-analyses and studies of what's effective, really is behind this and, and pushing it very strongly. Um, potential future benefits, of course, are that if the kinds of machine learning techniques that we talk about uh, become widely used, then these systems can be updated automatically rather than by manual review, and you can gain the advantages of uh, immediate feedback as new information becomes available. Um, now, the adoption of CPOE uh, was um, uh, recommended by the National Academy of Medicine uh, 
Uh, they wanted every hospital to use this by, by 1999, uh, and of course it hasn't happened. So I couldn't find current data, but uh, 2014 data shows that CPOE, for example, for medication orders is only being used in about 25% of the hospitals. And uh, at that time, people were extrapolating and saying, well, it's not going to reach 80% penetration until the year 2029. So it's a very slow adoption cycle, right? Maybe it's gotten better. Um, the other problem, and one of the reasons for resistance, is that uh, it puts additional stresses on people. So for example, um, this is a study of how pharmacists spend their time. And so uh, clinical, sp uh, clinical time is useful. That's when they're consulting with doctors, helping them figure out appropriate dosage for patients, or they're talking to patients, explaining to them how to take their medications, what side effects to watch out for, et cetera. These distributive tasks, it's a funny term, uh, mean the non-clinical part of what they're doing. Um, and what you see is that hospitals that have adopted CPOE, uh, they wind up spending a little bit more time on the distributive tasks and a little bit less time on the clinical tasks, which is probably not in the right direction in terms of, of what a pharmacists were hoping for uh, out of systems like this. Now, people have studied the diffusion of new medical technologies. Um, and uh, uh, I, I think I'll just show you the graph. So this is, uh, this is in England. Uh, but this is the adoption for statins. So from the time they were introduced, statins is a drug that keeps your cholesterol low. Uh, from the time they were introduced until they were being used essentially at 100% of places was about five and a half, six years. Okay, so reasonably fast. Uh, if you look at the adoption of magnetic resonance imaging technology, um, it took five years for it to have any adoption whatsoever, and that's because it was insanely expensive. And so there were all kinds of limitations. You know, even in Massachusetts, you had to get permission from some state committee uh, to buy a new MRI machine. And if another hospital in your town already had one, then they would say, well, you shouldn't buy one because you should be able to use this other hospital's MRI machine. Uh, same thing happened with CT. But as soon as those limitations <laughs> were lifted, boom, you know, uh, uh, it went up and then continues to go up. Uh, whereas stents, uh, I actually don't know why they were delayed by that long, uh, but this is for people with blockages in coronary arteries or other arteries. You can put in a little uh, mesh tube that just keeps that artery open. And that adoption was incredibly quick. Okay? So different things get adopted at different rates. Um, now the last topic I want to talk about before I, yeah. So what happens in those years where you just have spikes? What's, like, what's the uh, So according to those authors, uh, in the case of stents, there were some champions of the idea of stenting who went around and convinced their colleagues that this was the right technology to use. Um, and so there was just an explosive growth in it. Um, in the other technologies, you know, for, in the MRI case, money mattered a lot because they're so expensive. Stents are relatively cheap. Uh, and in the, in the case of uh, statins, uh, those are also relatively cheap, or they've become cheap since they went off patent. Originally, they were, they were much more expensive. Um, but, but there are still adoption problems. So for example, uh, there was a recommendation, I think about 15, maybe even 20 years ago, that said that anybody who has had a heart attack or, or coronary artery disease uh, should be taking beta blockers. Um, and I don't remember what the adoption rate is today, but it's, it's only on the order of a half. Um, and so um, uh, why? This is a dirt cheap drug uh, 
uh, for reasons not quite understood, it reduces the probability of having a second heart attack uh, by about 35%. So it's a really cheap, protective way of, of keeping people healthier, and yet it just hasn't suffused uh, practice as much as, as people think it should have. All right. Um, OK, so how do we assure the quality of these technologies before we foist them on the world? Um, and this is tricky. Uh, so uh, Johnny Anides, uh, a Stanford professor, has made an extremely successful career out of pointing out that most biomedical research is crap. Uh, it, it can't be reproduced. And there are some famous uh, publications that, that show that people have taken some area of biomedicine and they've looked at a bunch of, of well-respected published studies and they've gone to the lab and they've tried to replicate those studies and half the time or three quarters of the time they fail to do so. You go, oh my God, this is horrible, right? And it is horrible, yeah. What do you mean they fail to do so? Like they don't reproduce exactly the same results? Or like <coughs> what exactly? Uh, worse than that. Uh, so it's not that there are slight differences, it's that, for example, a result that was shown to be statistically significant in one study, when they repeat the study, is no longer statistically significant. Okay, that's bad if, if you base policy on, on that kind of decision. Uh, so Ioannidis has a suggestion, which would probably help a lot, and that is basically make known to everybody all the studies that have failed. So the problem is that if you give me a big data set and I start mining this data set, I'm going to find tons and tons of interesting correlations in this data. Okay? And as soon as I get one that has a good p-value, my students and I go, hmm, fantastic, <laughs> time, time to publish, right? Uh, now, consider the fact that I'm not the only person in this role. So, you know, David's group is doing the same thing, and John Gutag's and Regina Barzilay's and all of our colleagues at every other major university and hospital in the United States. And so there may be hundreds of people who are mining this data, and each of us has slightly different ways of doing it. We select our cases differently. We pre-process the data differently, we apply different learning algorithms to, the, to them. Um, but just by random chance, some of us are going to find interesting results, interesting patterns. And of course, those are the ones that get published. Because if you don't find an interesting result, you're not going to submit it to a journal and say, you know, I looked for the following fact phenomenon and I was unable to find it because the journal says, well, that's not interesting to anybody. <laughs> and so, um, so Ioannidis is recommending that uh, basically every study that anybody undertakes should be registered. And if you don't get a significant result, that should be known. And this would allow us to make at least some reasonable estimate of whether the significant results that were gotten are just the statistical outliers that happen to reach p equal 0.05 or whatever your threshold is, or whether uh, it's a real effect because not that many people have been trying this. Yeah. Just understand why you think this is due? Is it because of like the size of some cohort patients, or like bias in the dataset, or just purely randomness in the like, study? It, it could be any of those. It, it could be that you know your hospital has some biased data collection. And so you find an effect. My hospital doesn't, and so I don't find it. Uh, it could be that we just s randomly subsample the different sample of the population. Okay. Um, so it's very interesting. Last year, I was invited to a meeting by Jeff Drazen, who's the uh, uh, executive editor of the New England Journal. And he's thinking about, has not decided, but he's thinking about a policy for the New England Journal, which is like the top medical journal, uh, that says that he will not publish any result unless it's been replicated on, on two independent data sets. Right? 
So that's interesting, and that's an attempt to fight back against this problem. It's a different solution than what, uh, what Ioannid is, is recommending. Uh, so this was uh, uh, a study by Enrico Coera, uh, and uh, he's talking about what it means to replicate. And again, I'm not going to go through all this, but uh, there's a notion of replication might mean exact replication, i.e. you do exactly the same thing on exactly the same kind of data, but in a different data set. Uh, and then partial replication, conceptual replication, which says you follow the same procedures, but in a different environment, uh, and then quasi-replication, either partial or conceptual, and these have various characteristics that you can look at. It's an interesting framework. Um, so this is not a new idea. Uh, the first uh, edition of this book, Evaluation Methods in Biomedical Informatics, was called Evaluation Methods in Medical Informatics by the same authors uh, and was published uh, 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 a long time ago. I can't remember. This one is relatively recent. Um, and so they do a multi-hundred page, very detailed evaluation of exactly how one should evaluate uh, clinical systems like this. And it's very careful and very cautious, but it's also very conservative. So for example, one of the things that they recommend is that the people doing the evaluation should not be the people who develop the technique because there's innately bias in, you know, I want my technique to succeed. And so they say, hand it off to somebody else who doesn't have that same vested interest and then you're going to get a more careful evaluation. Um, so uh, Steve Pauker and I wrote a response to one of their early papers uh, recommending this uh, that said, well, that's so conservative that it sort of throws the baby out with the bathwater. Because if you make it so difficult to do an evaluation, you'll never get anything past it. And so we proposed instead a kind of staged evaluation that says, uh, first of all, you should do regression testing so that every time you use these agile development methods, you should have the set of cases that your program has worked on before. You should automatically rerun them and see which ones you've made better and which ones you've made worse. And that'll give you some insight into whether what you're doing is reasonable. Um, and then you might also build tools that look at automating ways of looking for inconsistencies in the models that you're, you're building. Uh, then you have retrospective review judged by clinicians. So you run a program that you like over a whole bunch of existing data, like what you're doing with MIMIC or with market scan. Uh, and then you do it prospectively, but without actually affecting patients. So you do it in real time as the data is coming in, uh, but you don't tell anybody <coughs> what the program results in. You just ask them to evaluate in retrospect to see whether it was right. And you might say, well, what's the difference between collecting the data in real time and collecting the data retrospectively? And historically, the answer is there is a difference. So circumstances differ. The mechanisms that you have for collecting the data differ. So this turns out to be an, an important issue. Um, and then you can run a prospective controlled trial where you're interested in evaluating both the answer that you get from the program and ultimately the effect on health outcomes. So if I have a decision support system, the ultimate proof of the pudding is if I run that decision support system, I give advice to clinicians. The clinicians change their behavior sometimes. Uh, and the patients get a better outcome, then I'm convinced that this is really useful. But you have to get there slowly because you don't want to give them worse outcomes. That's unethical and probably illegal. Um, and, and you want to compare this to the performance of unaided uh, doctors. So the Food and Drug Administration has been dealing with this issue for many, many years. Uh, I remember talking to them in about 1976 when they were reading about the very first uh, 
expert system programs for uh, diagnosis and therapy selection. And they said, well, how should we regulate these? And my response at the time was, God help us, keep your hands off, right? Because if you regulate it, uh, then you're going to slow down progress. And in any case, none of these programs are being used. These programs are being developed as experimental programs in experimental settings. They're not coming anywhere close to being used on real patients. Uh, and so there's not a regulatory issue. And about every five years, FDA has revisited that question. And they have continued to make essentially the same decision based on the rationale that, for example, they don't regulate books. If I write a textbook that explains something about medicine, um, uh, the FDA is not going to see whether it's correct or not. And the reason is because the expectation is that the textbook is making recommendations, so to speak, to uh, clinical practitioners who are responsible experts themselves. And so the ultimate responsibility for how they behave rests with them and not with the textbook. And they said, we're going to treat these computer programs as if they were dynamic textbooks rather than uh, uh, colleagues who are acting independently and giving advice. Now, as soon as you try to give that advice not to a professional but to a patient, then you're immediately under the regulatory auspices of FDA because now there is no professional intermediate that can evaluate the quality of, of that advice. So uh, what FDA has done uh, it, it just in the past year uh, is they've said that um, we're going to treat these AI-based quote-unquote devices as medical devices, and we're going to apply the same regulatory requirements that we have for these devices, except we don't really know how to do this. And so there's a kind of experiment going on right now where they're saying, OK, we're, submit applications for review of these devices to us. We will review them. Uh, and we will um, use um, these criteria, product quality, patient safety, clinical responsibility, cybersecurity responsibility, and a so-called proactive culture in the organization that's developing them in order to make a judgment of whether or not to let you proceed with marketing one of these things. Um, so if you look, there are, in fact, about 10 devices, quote unquote, these are all software, that have been approved so far by FDA. And almost all of them are imaging devices. They're, they're things that do uh, convolutional networks over one thing or another. Uh, and so here are just a few examples. Uh, Imogen has OsteoDetect, uh, which analyzes two-dimensional x-ray images for signs of distal radius fracture. So if you break your wrist, um, then this system will look at the x-ray and, and decide whether or not you've done that. Uh, here's one from IDX, uh, which looks at the uh, photographs of, of your retina and decides whether you have diabetic retinopathy. And actually, they've published a lot of papers that show that they can also identify heart disease and stroke risk. and various other things from those same photographs. So FDA has granted them approval to market uh, this thing. Uh, another one is uh, VIZ, uh, which uh, automatically analyzes CT scans for ER patients and is looking for uh, blockages in ma major brain blood vessels. So this can obviously lead to a stroke. And this is an automated technique that does that. Uh, and here's another one, um, uh, Arteris uh, measures and tracks tumors or potential cancers uh, in radiology images. So these are uh, the, uh, uh, the ones that have been approved. And then I just wanted to remind you that uh, there's actually plenty of literature about this kind of stuff. So the book on the left actually comes out next week um, and uh, uh, I got to read a preprint of it uh, by Eric Topol, who's one of these doctors who writes a lot about the future of medicine. Um, 
And he actually goes through tons and tons of examples of not only the systems that have been approved by FDA, but also things that are in the works that he's very optimistic that these will, again, revolutionize the practice of medicine. Uh, Bob Wachter, who wrote the book on the left uh, a couple of years ago, uh, is a little bit more cautious because he's chief of medicine at UC San Francisco. And he wrote this book in response to uh, them almost killing a kid by giving him a 39x overdose of uh, a medication. They didn't quite succeed <laughs> in killing the kid, so it turned out OK. Uh, but he was really concerned about how this wonderful technology led to such a disastrous outcome. And so he spent a year studying how these systems are being used and writes a more cautionary tale. OK, so let me turn to Adam, uh, who, uh, as I said, is, is a professor at, uh, at the Brigham and Harvard Medical School. Uh, and please come and join me, um, and we can uh, have a conversation. So my name is Adam Wright. I'm an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. In that role, I uh, lead a research program, and I teach the Introduction to Biomedical Informatics uh, courses at the medical school. So if you're interested in the topics that, that Pete was talking about today, you should definitely consider cross-registering in BMI 701 or 702 at uh, the medical school. We certainly uh, always uh, could use a few more enthusiastic, uh, uh, technically-minded machine learning experts in our, in our course. Um, and then uh, I have a uh, sort of operational job at Partners. Uh, Partners is the health system that includes Mass General Hospital and the Brigham and then uh, some community hospitals. And uh, I uh, work on uh, Partners eCare, which is our kind of cool brand name for, for Epic. Uh, so Epic is an EHR that we use at Partners. And uh, I help oversee uh, the clinical decision support there. So we have a decision support team. I'm the clinical lead for monitoring and evaluation. And so I help uh, make sure that our decision support systems of the, the type that people talking about uh, work correctly. So that's my, my job at the Brigham and the Partners. Cool. And, and I appreciate it very much. <laughs> Thanks. And um, I appreciate the invitation. It's fun to be here. Uh, so Adam, uh, first obvious question is, so sure. what kind of decision support systems have you guys actually yeah. put in place? Absolutely. So I, I mean, uh, you know, uh, we've had a long history at the Brigham and the Partners of using decision support. Um, Historically, we developed our own electronic health record, uh, which was a little bit unusual. Um, about three years ago, we switched from our self-developed system to Epic, uh, which is a very widely used uh, commercial electronic health record. And uh, uh, to, to the point that you gave, we really started with a lot of medication-related decision support. So that's things like drug interaction alerting. So you prescribe two drugs that might interact with each other. And we use a table, you know, no, no machine learning or anything particularly complicated that says we think this drug might interact with this. We raise an alert to the doctor or to the pharmacist, and they make a decision uh, using their expertise as, as the learned intermediary about whether to continue with that prescription. We also have some dosing support, allergy checking, and, and things like that. So our first kind of set of decision support really was around medications. And then we turned to kind of a broader set of things like preventive care reminders. So identifying patients that are overdue for a mammogram or a pap smear, or that might benefit from a statin or something like that, or a beta blocker in the case of, of acute uh, myocardial infarction. And uh, we make suggestions to the doctor or to other members of the care team to, to do those things. Again, those historically have largely been rule-based. So mm -hmm. some experts sat down and wrote Boolean if-then rules uh, using variables that, that are in a patient's chart. We have uh, increasingly, though, started uh, trying to use some predictive models for things like readmission or uh, whether a patient is at risk of falling down in the hospital. Um, a big problem that patients often encounter is they're in the hospital, you know, they're kind of delirious, the hospital's a weird place, it's dark, they get up to go to the bathroom, they trip on their, you know, IV uh, tubing, and then they, they fall and are injured. And so we would like to prevent that from happening, because that's obviously uh, kind of a bad thing to happen to you once you're in the hospital. And so we have some machine learning based tools for predicting patients that are at risk for falling. Falls. And then there's a set of you know interventions like putting the bed rails up or putting an alarm that buzzes when they're uh, if they get out of bed or in more extreme cases having a, a sitter like a person who actually sits in the room with them and uh, tries to keep them from getting up or assists them to the bathroom or calls them who can assist them to, to the bathroom. So uh, we have increasingly started using the, those uh, uh, machine learning tools, some of which we get from third parties like from our electronic health record vendor, and some of which we sort of train ourselves on on our own data. Uh, but th that's a newer. Uh, pursuit for us is this machine learning. So when you have something like a risk model, yeah. how do you decide where to set the threshold? You yeah. know, if, if I'm at 
53% uh, right. risk of, of falling. Yeah. Should you get a sitter to sit by my bedside? It's, it's complicated, right? I mean, I would like to say that what we do is sort of a full kind of, you know, utility analysis, right? Where we say we pay a sitter this much per hour and the risk of falling is this much and the cost of a fall, you know, most patients who fall aren't hurt, uh, but, but some are. And so uh, you would sort of calculate the, um, you know, the cost benefit of each of those things and, you know, sort of figure out where on the ROC curve you want to put, place yourself. Um, in practice, I think we often uh, just play it by, by ear, uh, in part because a lot of our, our things are intended to be suggestions, right? So, so mm -hmm. our threshold for saying to the doctor, hey, this patient is at elevated risk for fall, consider doing something, is pretty low. Uh, if the system were, say, automatically ordering a sitter, uh, we, we might set it higher. I would say that's an area of, of research. I would also say that, that uh, one challenge we have is we often set and forget these kinds of systems, right? And so there, there's, you know, kind of feature drift and patients change over time. We probably should do a better job of then looking back to see how well they're actually working and uh, making tweaks to, to the thresholds. Really good question. But these are, of course, very complicated yeah. decisions. Um, Absolutely. I, I remember uh, uh, 50 years ago talking to some people in the Air Force. Yeah about uh, how much should, should they invest, invest in safety measures. Right. And, and they had a, a, a utility theoretic model yeah. that said, uh, okay, uh, how much does it cost to replace a pilot if you kill him? Yeah, yikes, okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and th this was not publicized a yeah. lot. <laughs> no, I mean, we, we do calculate things like quality adjusted life years and disability yeah. adjusted life years. So there is, in all of medicine, right, as, as people de deploy resources, kind of this calculus. And I think we uh, tend to assign a really high weight to, to patient harm, right? Because patient harm is, is the, if you think about the kind of the, the oath the doctors swear, right, first do no harm, right? The worst thing we can do is harm you in the, the hospital. So I think we have a pretty strong av aversion to do that. But it's hard to, it's very hard to weigh these things. I think one of the challenges we often run into is that uh, different doctors would make different decisions, right? Yeah. So if you put the same patient in front of 10 doctors and said, does this patient need a sitter? Maybe half would say yes and half would say no. And so it's especially hard to know what to do with a decision support system if the humans can't agree on, on what you should do in a particular situation. So the other thing we talked about on the phone yeah. yesterday is I was concerned a few years ago I was visiting uh, one of these august uh, Boston mm -hmm. area hospitals yeah. and, uh, and asked to see a um, uh, an example of somebody interacting with this computerized physician yes. order entry system. And the, um, the senior resident who, who was taking me around um, uh, went up to the computer and said, well, I think I remember how to use this. <laughs> and I said, wait a minute, <laughs> this is something you're expected to use daily. Yeah. Uh, but in reality, what happens is that it's not the senior doctors or even the medium senior doctors, it's, it's the interns and the junior residents who actually use the systems. Which is true, yeah. And, and the concern I had was that um, it takes a junior resident with a lot of guts mm -hmm. to go up to the you know, chief of, of your service yes. and say, uh, Dr. X, uh, even though you asked me to order this drug for this patient, uh, the computer is arguing back that you should use this other one instead. Yeah. Yeah, it does. And in fact, I actually th thought of this a little more after we chatted about it. And uh, we've heard from residents that people have said to them, if you dare page me with an epic suggestion in the middle of the night, uh, I'll never talk to you again. So, you know, just override all of the, the, those alerts. So I think that, you know, one of the challenges is, uh, and there, there's some, you know, it was a cool ability on, on our part is that a lot of these alerts we give are, you know, uh, have a PPV of like, you know, 10 or 20%, right? You know, they are usually wrong. It's, we think it's really important, so, so we really raise uh, these alerts a lot. But people uh, experience this kind of alert fatigue or what people call alarm fatigue. You see this in cockpits uh, too, but people get too many alerts and they start ignoring the alerts. Uh, they assume that they're wrong. They tell the resident not to page them in the middle of the night, no, no matter what the computer says. So I do think that we have some, some responsibility to improve the, the accuracy of, of these alerts. And I do think, you know, machine learning could, could help us. We're actually just having a meeting about a pneumococcal vaccination alert. This is something that helps people uh, remember to prescribe this uh, vaccination to help you uh, not get pneumonia. And 
uh, it takes four or five variables into account. We started looking at the cases where people would override the alert, and they were mostly appropriate, right? So the patient is, you know, in a really extreme state right now, or conversely, the patient is close to the end of life, and they're not going to benefit from this vaccination, or the patient has a phobia of needles, or the patient has an insurance problem. And we think there's probably more like 30 or 40 variables that you would need to take into account to make that really accurate. And so the mm -hmm. question is, when you have that many variables, can a human uh, develop and maintain that logic? Uh, or would uh, we be better off trying to use a machine learning system to, to do that? Would that really work or, or not? And so. so how far are we from being able to use a machine learning system to do that? Yeah, I think that the biggest challenge, honestly, uh, relates to the sort of availability and accuracy of, of the data in, in our systems. Um, so Epic, which is the EHR that we're using, uh, and Cerner, and Allscripts, and, and most of the major systems, have various ways to run even kind of sophisticated machine learning models, either inside of the system or sort of kind of bolted onto the system and then feeding uh, uh, model inferences back into the to the system. Um, when I was giving that example of the pneumococcal vaccination, one of the major problems is that there's not always a really good uh, structured way in the system that we indicate that a patient is at the end of life and receiving comfort measures only, or that the patient is in a really extreme state, that we're in the middle of the uh, code blue and that we need to sort of pause for a second and stop giving you know these kind of friendly preventive care suggestions. And so I would actually say that the biggest barrier to really good machine learning based decision support is just the, the lack of good reliably documented, coded, usable features. It's, uh, uh, I think that uh, the second challenge obviously is workflow, right? You said sort of, you know, it's sometimes hard to know in the hospital who a patient's doctor is, right? The patient is admitted and on the care team is an intern, a junior resident, and a fellow, an attending, several specialists, a couple of nurses, and who should get that message or who should get that page? I think workflow is, is second. Um, uh, my, uh, this is where I think you may have said I have some optimism. I actually think that the technical ability of our EHR software to run these models is, is better than it was three or five years ago, and it's actually usually not the barrier in, in the studies that we've done. So there, there were attempts, um, uh, again, 20 years ago, yeah. uh, to create kind of formal rules about yes. who gets notified under Absolutely. what circumstances. I remember one of the doctors I worked with at, at Tufts Medical Center uh, was going crazy because yeah. uh, the, when they implemented a new lab information system, yeah. it would alert on every abnormal <laughs> lab. Right. Um, and this is crazy. Yeah. Um, but there were other hospitals that said, well, uh, let's be a little more sophisticated about yep. when it's necessary to alert. And then if somebody doesn't respond to an alert within a very short period of time, yep. then we escalate it to yep. somebody higher up or somebody else on the Absolutely. care team. Yeah. And that seemed like a reasonable idea to yeah. me. But are there things like that in place now? Or? There are. And it works very differently in the inpatient and the outpatient setting, right? The inpatient setting, yeah. we're providing very kind of acute care to a patient. And so we have processes where people sort of sign in and out of the, the care team. And uh, in fact, the sort of prevalence of these automated messages is an incentive to sort of do that well, right? So if I go home, I better sign myself out of that patient. Otherwise, I'm going to get all these pages all night uh, about them. And uh, the system sort of will, you know, always make sure that somebody is the responding uh, uh, provider. Uh, it becomes a little thornier in the outpatient setting, right? Because a lot of you know the academic doctors at the Brigham uh, only have clinic, you know, half a day a week. And so the question is, if an abnormal result comes back, should I send it to that doctor? Uh, should I send it to the person that's sort of on call in that clinic? Should I send it to the to the head of the clinic? There are also these sort of edge cases that, that sort of messes up a lot, right? And so a classic one is a patient is in the hospital. I've ordered some lab tests. They're looking well, so I discharge the patient. The test is still pending at the time the patient is discharged, and now who does that go to? Like, should it go to the patient's primary care doctor? Do they have a primary care doctor? Should it go to the person that ordered the test? That person uh, may be on vacation now if it's a test that kind of takes a few weeks to come back. So we still struggle with, we call those T-pads, tests pending a discharge. We still struggle with some, some of those edge cases. But I think in the core, we're, we're pretty good at it. Um, so one of the things we talked about is uh, a, so an experience I've had, and you've probably yeah. had, <clears throat> that um, for example, a few years ago, I was working with the people who run the clinical labs at Mass General, and they run some ancient laboratory information system, system that, as you said, can add yeah. and subtract, but not <laughs> multiply or divide. It can or, add and multiply, but not subtract or divide, or yes. And it doesn't support it. negative numbers, <laughs> only unsigned integers. Uh, so, uh, 
<laughs> there are these wonderful legacy systems around yeah. uh, that, that really create horrendous problems uh, yeah. because if you try to build anything, I mean, even a yeah. risk prediction calculator, yeah. uh, it, it, it really helps to be able to divide <laughs> as sure. well as multiply. <laughs> um, and uh, so we've struggled uh, in, in that project, and I, I'm sure you've had similar Absolutely. experiences with how do we incorporate uh, a decision support system into some of this creaky old technology that, yeah. that just doesn't support it. Yeah. So what, what's the so right approach to there that? There are a lot of architectures and they all have, have pros and cons. I, I'm not sure if any one of them is sort of the, the right approach. I think we often do favor using the sort of, you know, creaky old technology or the new technology, right? So, so Epic has a built-in uh, rule engine. Uh, that laboratory system that you're talking about has a basic calculation engine with so, so, some significant uh, limitations to it. Um, so where we can, we often will try to build rules internally using these systems. Those tend to sort of have real-time availability of data, the best ability to sort of push alerts <coughs> to the person right in their workflow and make the, those alerts actionable. Um, in cases where we can't do that, like for example, a model that's too complex to execute in the system, uh, one thing that we've often done is uh, sort of run that model against our data warehouse. So we have a data warehouse that extracts the data from the electronic health record every night at midnight. And so if we don't need real-time data, it's possible to uh, run, extract the data, run a model, and then actually write a risk score or a flag back into the patient's record that can then be shown to the uh, clinician or used to drive an alert or something like that. That works uh, really well, uh, except uh, that uh, a lot of things that happen particularly in patient setting, uh, like predicting sepsis, uh, depend on real-time data, data that we need right away. And so uh, we uh, run into the challenge where that particular approach only works, uh, you know, kind of on a 24-hour kind of retrospective uh, basis. Um, we have also developed systems uh, that uh, sort of depend on uh, messages. So there's this HL7 is a standard format for exchanging data with an electronic health record. Um, there's various versions and, and profiles uh, of HL7. But you can sort of set up an infrastructure that sits outside of the EHR and gets messages in real time from the EHR and makes inferences and sort of sends messages back into the, the EHR. Um, increasingly, EHRs also do support uh, sort of kind of web service approaches, right? So that you can register a hook and say, call my hook whenever this thing happens, or you can pull the EHR to get data out and use another web service to, to write data back in. That's worked uh, really well for, for us. Um, you can also uh, sort of uh, ask the EHR to sort of uh, embed an app that you develop. So people here may have heard or should hear at some point about Smart on Fire, which is a uh, open kind of API uh, that allows you to sort of develop an application and embed that application into an electronic health record. Uh, we've increasingly been building some of those those applications. Uh, the downside right now of the smart apps is that they're really good for sort of reading data out of the record and sort of visualizing or displaying it, but they don't uh, always have a lot of capability to sort of write data back into the record or, or take actions. Mm -hmm. Most of the HR vendors also have a uh, proprietary uh, approach, like an app store. So Epic calls there's the App Orchard, and, and uh, most of the HRs have something similar, uh, where you can join a developer program and uh, uh, sort of build an application, and uh, uh, those are often more full-featured. Uh, they tend to be proprietary, so if you build one Epic app, you have to then build a Cerner app and an Allscripts app and an eClinicalWorks app uh, separately. Uh, there are often heavy fees uh, for joining those programs, although mm -hmm. uh, the EHR vendors, Epic in particular, have lowered their prices a lot. And uh, uh, the federal government, the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT, uh, just about a week and a half ago released some new regulations which uh, uh, really uh, limit uh, the uh, uh, rate at which vendors can charge application developers for API access, uh, uh, basically to, to almost nothing except for kind of incremental uh, uh, computation costs or special support. And so I think that may change everything uh, now that that regulation has been promulgated. So we'll see. So contrary to my pessimistic beginning, um, yeah. th this actually is the thing that makes me most optimistic yeah. that even five years ago, if you looked at many of these systems, uh, they, they essentially locked you out. Absolutely. Uh, I remember in the uh, early 2000s, I was at, at the University of Pittsburgh um, where they had, they had one of the first um, centers that was doing heart-lung transplants. Um, and uh, so their people had built a special application for supporting heart-lung heart transplant patients uh, in their own homemade uh, electronic medical record system. And then UPMC went to uh, Cerner right. at the time.
And I remember I was at some meeting where the doctors who ran this heart-lung transplant unit were talking to the Cerner people and saying, uh, you know, how could we get something to support our yeah. special needs for our patients? And Cerner's answer was, well, you know, commercially it doesn't make sense for us to do this because at the time there were like four hospitals in the country that, that did this. And so it's not a big, uh, a big money maker. And so their offer was, well, you pay us an extra $3 million and within three years we will develop yeah. <laughs> the uh, appropriate software for you. So that, that's just crazy, right? I mean, that's a totally untenable uh, way of going about things. And now that there are systematic ways for you either to embed your own code uh, into one of these systems or at least to have a well-documented, reasonable way of feeding data out and then feeding results back into the yeah. system, that makes it possible to do uh, special purpose uh, applications like this uh, uh, or experimental applications or all kinds of novel things. So that, yeah. that's great. That's what we're optimistic about. I mean, I think it's it's worth adding that there's sort of two barriers you have to get through, right? One is Epic has to sort of let you into their app orchard, uh, which is sort of the barrier that is increasingly lower. And then you need to find a hospital or a healthcare provider that wants to use your app, right? You know, so, so you kind of have to uh, clear both of those. But uh, I think uh, it's increasingly possible. You've got smart people here at MIT or uh, at the hospitals uh, that we have in, in Boston sort of always sort of wanting to, to build these apps. And I would say uh, five years ago, we would have told people, sorry, it's not possible. And today we're able usually to tell people that uh, if there's clinical interest, uh, the technical part will fall into place. So that's exciting for us. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, question about that. So Absolutely. Some of the applications that you guys developed, house, yeah. do you also put those on the Epic Orchard, or do you just sort of implement it one time within your own system? Yeah, th there's a lot of different ways that, that we sort of sh share these applications, right? So a lot of us are researchers, so we will, you know, release an open source version of the application or, or uh, uh, you know, write a paper and say this is available and we'll sort of share it with you. The App Orchard is uh, particularly focused on applications that you want to sell. Uh, so our hospital hasn't decided that we wanted to sell any applications. We've given a lot of applications away. Epic also has something called the Community Library, which is like the App Orchard, but it's free instead of costing money. And so we, we released a ton of stuff through the, the Community Library. Uh, to, to the point that I was sort of uh, poking at before, one of the challenges is that if we build a Smart on Fire app, we're able to sort of share that publicly. Uh, we can post that on the web, we put it on GitHub, and anybody can, can use it. Um, Epic uh, has uh, a position that their uh, APIs uh, are uh, proprietary and they represent Epic's valuable intellectual property or, or trade secrets. And so uh, we're only allowed to share uh, those apps through the, the Epic ecosystem. And so uh, we often now when we get a grant, most of my work is, is through grants, we'll have an Epic site and we'll share that through the community library and we'll have a Cerner site and we'll share it through Cerner's uh, equivalent. But I think until the uh, capability of the open APIs like Smart on Fire uh, reaches the same level as the proprietary APIs, we're still somewhat locked into having to build different versions and distribute through each, each EHR vendor separate channels. Really, really good question. And so what, what, what's lacking in uh, things like Smart on Fire yeah. That, that you get from the native uh, interfaces. So I mean, it's it's very situational, right? So so, so for example, so in you know in some EHR implementations, the Smart on Fire will give you a list of the patient's current medications, but may not give you historical medications, or it will tell you that the medicine is ordered, but it won't tell you whether it's been administered. Um, so uh, one half of the battle is less complete uh, data. The other one is that uh, uh, we most EHRs are not implementing at this point the sort of write back capabilities or the actionable mm. capabilities uh, it, that Smart on Fire is, is sort of working on and it's really some standards for. So if we want to build an application that sort of shows how a patient fits on a growth curve, that's fine. If we want to build an application that suggests ordering medicines, uh, that, that can be really challenging. Whereas the internal APIs that the vendors provide uh, typically have both read and write capabilities. So, so that's the other and, challenge. And do the vendors worry about um, uh, I guess two related things. Yeah. One is sort of cognitive overload, yeah. because if, if you build a thousand smart right. on fire apps and yeah. they all start firing for these inpatients, yeah. you're going to be back in the same situation yeah. of, of over alerting. And the other question is, is are they worried about liability? Since yes. if, if you're using their system to display um, recommendations, yeah. 
and those recommendations turn out to be wrong and harm right. some patient, then somebody will reach out to them legally yeah. because they have a lot of money. Absolutely. They're, they're worried about both of those uh, related particularly to the second one. They're also worried about just sort of, you know, corruption or integrity of, of the data, right? So somehow if I can write a medication order directly to the database and uh, it, it may bypass certain checks that would be done normally and, and uh, I could potentially enter a wrong or, or, or dangerous uh, order. The other thing that, that I think we're increasingly hearing is sort of concerns about kind of uh, protection of, of data, sort of Cambridge Analytica style uh, worries, mm -hmm. right? So if I, uh, as an Epic patient, authorize you know the you know Words with Friends app to like see my medical record, and then they <laughs> post that on the the web or sort of monetize it in some sort of uh, uh, tricky way. Uh, what liability, if any, does my healthcare provider organization or my uh, uh, the EHR vendor? have for that, and, and the new regulations are extremely strict, right? They say that if a patient asks you to, and authorizes an app to uh, access their record, you may not block that access, even if you consider that app to be a bad actor. And so yeah. um, that's, I think, an area of liability that is just beginning to be sorted out, and it is, uh, I think, so, some cause for, for concern. But at the same time, you could imagine a universe where I think uh, there are conservative healthcare organizations that would choose to never authorize any application uh, to avoid uh, uh, risk. So how you balance that is, is not yet solved. Well, or, or, and to avoid leakage. So I, I remember uh, years ago, uh, there was a lot of reluctance, uh, even among Boston area hospitals, yeah. to share data because sure. they were worried that another hospital could cherry pick their most lucrative patients right. by figuring out uh, something about them. Yeah. So I'm sure that that hasn't gone away as a Absolutely. concern. Absolutely, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, we're going to try to remember to repeat the questions you're asking oh, so that okay. uh, uh, because of the recording. Happy to. Uh, yeah. So how does a third party vendor uh, yeah. deploy like a machine learning model on yeah. your system? So is yeah. that done through Epic? Like obviously there's yeah. a work or your kind of thing. Yep. But it, is there ways to go around that and go directly right. into partners and whatnot? How does that work? Yeah, so, so the question is how does a third party vendor deploy an application or a machine learning model or something like that? And so uh, with Epic, uh, there's uh, always a relationship between the uh, vendor of the application and the healthcare provider organization. And so uh, we could work d together directly. So if you had an app that the Brigham wanted to use, uh, you could uh, share uh, that app uh, with us in a, a number of ways. So Epic supports this, this thing called predictive modeling markup language, or PMML. So if you train a model, you can export a PMML model, and I can import it into Epic and, and run it natively, or you can produce a web service that I call out to and uh, uh, sort of gives me an answer. We could work together directly. Uh, uh, however, um, there are some limitations in what I'm allowed to sort of tell you or share with you about Epic's data model and Epic, what Epic perceives to be their, their intellectual property. And so um, it is uh, facilitated by you joining this program. Because if you join this program, you get access to documentation that you would otherwise not have access to. Uh, you may get access to a test harness or a test system that lets you sort of validate uh, uh, your work. However, people who join the program often think that means that I can then just run my app at every customer, right? But with Epic in particular, you have to then make a deal with me to use it at the Brigham and make a deal with you know my colleague to use it at Stanford. Uh, uh, other EHR vendors have developed a more sort of centralized model where you can actually sort of release it and sell it and I can pay for it directly through through the app store and, and, and integrate it. I think that last mile piece hasn't really been standardized yet. I guess one of my questions there yeah. is what happens in the case that I don't want to talk to Epic at all yeah. and just like uh, I looked at your data and just yep. like Brigham and Women's stuff yep. and, and I built a really good model you saw yeah. it works yep. and we just want to like deploy it. Epic would not stop us for, from doing that. Uh, the, the only real restriction is that Epic would limit my ability to tell you stuff about Epic's guts and so uh, you would need a relatively sophisticated healthcare uh, provider organization who could map between some sort of kind of platonic data clinical data model and Epic's internal data model. But if you had that, uh, uh, you could. And I mean, at the Brigham, we have this iHub innovation program, and we're probably working with uh, 50 to 100 startups of doing work like that, some of whom are members of the Epic App Orchard and some of whom choose not to be members of the Epic App Orchard. It's worth saying that joining the App Orchard or these programs entails revenue sharing with Epic and, and some complexity. That may go way down with these new regulations, but right now some organizations have chosen not to not to partner with the vendors and work directly with the healthcare provider organizations. So on the quality side of that yeah. question, if you do develop an application yes, and sir. field it at the Brigham, um, 
will, the, will Stanford be interested in, in taking it or are they going to be concerned about the fact that somehow you fit it to the patient population in Boston and it won't be appropriate to their data? Yeah, I think that's a fundamental question, right, is to what extent uh, do these models generalize, right? Can you uh, train a model at one place and transfer it to, to another place? I think we generally seem that uh, many of them transfer pretty well, right? So if they really uh, have more to do with kind of core human physiology, that can be pretty similar between organizations. If they're sort of really bound up in a particular workflow, right, they, you know, they assume that you're doing this task, this task, this task in this order, they tend to transfer really, really <laughs> poorly. So I would say that our general approach has been to take a model that somebody has, sort of run it retrospectively on our data warehouse, and see if it's accurate. And if it is, we might go forward with it. If it's not, we would uh, try to retrain it on our data and then see how much improvement we get by, by retraining it. And so have you, in fact, imported such uh, models we from have, other yeah, places? We have, yeah, yeah. Uh, Epic uh, provides five or six models, and we, we just started using uh, so, some of them at, at the Brigham, or just kind of signed a license to, to begin using them. And uh, I think Epic's guidance and our experiences, that they, they can work pretty well out of the box. Okay. Pulley. So could you say yeah. a little bit more about the, these risk scores that are being deployed? You know, maybe they work, maybe yeah. they don't. How, how can you really tell whether they're working, you need, even just beyond sort of like patient shift over time, just like yeah. how people react to the scores. Like I know right. a lot of the bias and fairness works is like yeah. people, if a score agrees with their intuition, they'll mm -hmm. trust it, and if it doesn't, they ignore the score. Yeah. So like how, what does the process look like for you to deploy the score yeah. thing and then see whether it's working? Yeah, absolutely. So, so the question is, we get a risk score, we deploy a new risk score, it says patient has a risk of falling or patient has a risk of having sepsis or something like that. Um, you know, we tend to do several levels of evaluation, right? So, so the first level is, when we show the score, what do people do, right? Mm -hmm. If we, uh, typically we don't just show a score, we make a recommendation. We say, based on the score, we think you should order a lactate to see if the patient is at risk of, of having sepsis. First, we look to see if people do what we say, right? So we think it's a good sign if people sort of follow the, the suggestions. But ultimately, you know, we view ourselves as sort of clinical trialists, right? So we deploy this model with an intent to move something, right? To reduce the rate of sepsis or to reduce the rate of mortality in sepsis. And so we would try to sort of measure, if nothing else, do a before and after study, right? Measure the rates before, implement this intervention, and measure the, the, the rates after. In cases where we're sort of less sure or where we really care about the results, we'll even do a randomized trial, right? So we'll give half of the units, we'll get a, uh, the alert, half the units won't get the alert, and we'll actually compare uh, the effect on a clinical outcome and, and see what the, what the difference is. And in our opinion, unless we can show sort of an effect on these clinical uh, uh, measures, uh, we shouldn't be bothered people, right? You know, Pete made this point that, you know, what's the purpose of having, you know, if we have a thousand alerts, everyone will be overwhelmed. So we should only keep alerts on if we can show that they're making a real clinical difference. And are those sort of like just internal checks or are there papers of like some of these deployments? Uh, it's our it's our intent to publish everything, uh -huh. right? I mean, I think we're we're behind, but I'd say you know we, we publish everything. We off we have some things that we finished that we haven't published yet. That they're sort of the next thing to sort of come out. Cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess. Uh, so earlier we were talking about how um, sort of the models are just used to give recommendations yeah. to the doctors. Uh, do you have any metric in terms of how often the model recommendation matches with the uh, doctor's decision? Yeah, absolutely. So, oh yeah, th thanks David. So the question is, do we ever check to see how often the model recommendation matches what the doctor uh, uh, does? And so there's sort of two ways we do that. We'll often retrospectively test the model back. And so I think Pete shared a paper for, from Cerner where they looked at the, these sort of suggestions that they made to order lactates or to do other sort of sepsis works up. And they looked to see whether uh, the recommendations that they made matched uh, what the doctors had actually done. And they, they showed that they, in many cases, did. So that'll be the first thing that we do is before we even turn the model on, we'll run it in sort of silent mode and see if the doctor does what we suggest. Now, the doctor is not a perfect supervision, right? Because the doctor may uh, neglect to do something that would be good to do. So then when we turn it on, we actually look to see whether the doctor takes the action that we uh, uh, suggested. Uh, and if we're doing it in this randomized mode, we would then look to see whether the doctor takes the action we suggested more often in the case where we show the alert than where we generate the alert, but uh, sort of just log it and don't, don't show it. Yeah. Sir. So um, you, you'd mentioned how there's the, the sort of like kind of related to the alarm fatigue, like if it's yeah. code blue, like these alarms are right. Blue. And you said that cockpits have like, like, like pilots yeah. now that have some more problems. My very limited understanding of like aviation yeah. is that if you're flying like say below 10,000 feet, then like almost all yeah. of the alarms get turned off. And yep. I don't know if there seems to be an analog for that for hospitals yeah. yet. And is that just because the technology workflow is not mature enough yet, only like 10 years old? Or is that yeah. like kind of 
Pete's question about the incentives between, um, you know, if you build a tool and it doesn't flag this thing, if yeah. it dies, then they could get sued, and so they're just yeah. Very, no, we, we try, right? So, so, so we often don't know about the situations in a structured way at the EHR. And so uh, most of our alerts are suppressed in the operating room, right? So during an when a patient is on anesthesia, you know, their physiology is being sort of manually controlled by, by a doctor. And so uh, we often suppress the alerts in, in those situations. I guess I didn't say, say the question, but the question was, <laughs> do we try to take situations into account or how much can we? Uh, we didn't used to know that a code blue was going on because we used to do most of our code blue documentation on paper. We now use this code narrator, right, so we can tell when a code blue starts, when a code blue ends. A code blue is like a cardiac arrest and resuscitation of the patient, and so we actually do increasingly turn a lot of alerting off during a, a code blue. I get uh, an email or a page whenever a doctor overrides an alert and, like, writes a cranky message, uh, and they'll often say something like, you know, this patient is dying of, uh, you know, of a myocardial infarction right now, and you're bothering me about this influenza vaccination. And then what I'll do is I'll go back, you know, seriously, I, I got that yesterday. And so what I'll do is I'll go back and look in the record and say, what signs did I have that this patient was sort of in extremis? And uh, in that particular case, it was a patient who came into the ED and like very little documentation had been started. And so there actually were very few signs uh, that the patient was in the sort of acute state. Uh, I think, you know, someday could we be smarter about integrating monitor data and device data to, to figure that out. But at that point, we didn't have a good uh, structured data element in the chart that said this patient is like so ill that it's offensive to suggest an influenza vaccination right now. So. Now, there, there are hospitals that have started experimenting yeah. with things like acquiring data from the ambulance as yeah. the patient is coming in yep. so that the ED is already primed yeah. with preliminary data. Yeah. And in that circumstance, you could tell so this is the interoperability challenge, right? So we actually get uh, the run sheet, all the, the ambulance data uh, to us. It comes in as a, a PDF that's transmitted from the ambulance uh, emergency management system to, to our EHR. And so it's not coming in in a way that we can sort of read it well, but to your, your point exactly, if we were better at interoperability, I've also talked to hospitals who, you know, use things like, you know, video cameras and people's badges, and if there's 50 people sort of hovering around a patient, that's a sign that something bad is happening. And so um, <laughs> we might be able to use something like, like, like that. But uh, yeah, we're, we're, we'd like to be better at that. So wh why did HL7 version three not solve all these problems. <laughs> this is a good philosophical question. Come to BMI 701 and 702 and we'll talk about uh, <laughs> uh, standards. HL7, uh, his question, version 2 is a very practical standard. Version 3 was a very uh, deeply philosophical standard. Aspirational. That never, aspirational that never quite uh, caught on. And it did in pieces. I mean, smart uh, fire is a simplification of, of that. Yeah. Uh, so I think usually the machine learning models are like evaluated statistically among yes, sir. population. When it comes to a particular patient, you yeah. really should know how reliable the model is. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there's calibration, right? So we can say this model works particularly well in these patients or, or not as well in these patients. There are some, you know, very simple equations or models that, that we use, for example, where we use a different model in African-American patients versus, uh, uh, you know, non-African-American patients because there's some data that says that this model is better calibrated in this subgroup of patients for, versus another. Um, I do think, though, to, to your point, that there's a suggestion, you know, an inference from a model. This patient is at, at risk of a fall. And then there's this whole set of, you know, kind of value judgments and uh, beliefs and knowledge and understanding of a patient's circumstances uh, that are very human. And I think that that's largely why we uh, deliver these suggestions to a doctor or to a nurse. And then that human uses that information plus their expertise and their relationship and their experience uh, to uh, make a suggestion rather than, than, you know, just having the computer adjust the knob on, on the ventilator itself. Uh, a question that people always ask me, and I think you should ask me, is will we eventually not need that, that human? And I think I'm more optimistic th than some people that there are cases where the computer is good enough or the human is poor enough that it would be safe uh, to sort of have a, a close to closed uh, loop. Uh, however, I think those cases are, are not the norm. I think that there'll be more cases where, where human doctors are still very much, very much needed. So I, I'd just add that there are tasks where, uh, where patients are fungible, in the words that I used uh, a, a few lectures ago. Uh, so for example, a lot of hospitals are uh, developing models that predict whether a patient will show up for their uh, optional surgery, uh, because then it, they can do a better job of overscheduling the operating room 
in the same way that the airlines over oversell seats um, because statistically you could win doing that. Uh, those are very safe predictions because the worst thing that happens is you get delayed, but it's not going to have a harmful outcome on, on an individual patient. Yeah. And conversely, there are people that are working on machine learning systems for dosing insulin or adjusting people's ventilator settings, and uh, those are uh, high, those high, are risk, high risk, uh, high yeah. risk jobs. Yeah. All right, last question because we have to wrap up. Um, you had alluded to some of the second for death problems. Yes. Uh, yeah. Two, once, you know, it's been determined that actually a significant failure issue has occurred, what yeah. are some of the decisions that you make regarding trade-offs using an average model that may Absolutely. Sell signal versus cost of retraining? Retraining, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so the question is, the kind of the set and forget, right? We build the model, the model be, may become stale. Should we update the, the model and how do we decide to, to do that? I mean, we're using, you know, it depends what you define as a model. We're using tables and rules that we've developed since the, the 1970s. Um, I think uh, we have a pretty high uh, desire to sort of periodically revisit those. This problem in, in the field of practice is called knowledge management or knowledge engineering, right? How do we sort of remember which of our knowledge bases need to be sort of checked again or, or updated? And uh, uh, we'll often, you know, just as a standard, retrain a model or reevaluate a knowledge base every six months or, or every year uh, because uh, it's uh, both harmful to patients uh, if, if this stuff is out of date, and it also makes us look stupid, right? So if you know there's a new paper that comes out and says beta blockers are terrible poison, and we keep suggesting them, then, then people no longer believe uh, the, the, the suggestions uh, we make. Uh, that said, we still make mistakes, right? I mean, things happen all the time. Uh, a lot of my work has focused on malfunctions in these systems, and so, so as an example, you know, uh, if uh, periodically the pharmacy might change the code or ID number for a medicine, or a new medicine might come on the market, and and uh, we have to make sure to continually update the knowledge base so that we're not suggesting an old medicine or overlooking the fact that the patient's already been prescribed a, a new medicine. And so we try to do that pro prospectively or proactively, but then we also uh, try to listen to feedback from users and, and fix things as we go. Cool. And uh, just one, one more comment on that. Uh, so some things are done in real time. Uh, there was a system many years ago at, at uh, um, uh, Intermountain Health in Salt Lake City where they were uh, looking at what bugs were growing out of microbiology samples in the laboratory. And of course, that can change on an hour by hour or day to day basis. And so they were updating those systems that warned you about uh, the possibility of that kind of infection in real time by taking feeds directly from the laboratory. All right, thank you very much. Thank uh, you guys.